Chapter 16, we cover the statement of cash flows. So there are your learning objectives. Um, and, and the statement of cash flows is actually a very important financial statement. Sometimes students struggle to prepare it. There'll be a couple sections that are a little bit trickier than the others, but investors really do look at that statement of cash flows because basically what it does is it shows an investor how the the company is spending money are they and, and making money are they making money from their operations and then where are they investing that money and then plus it tells them again like are they borrowing um do they have the extra cash to to pay their debts as it comes due and are they able to pay dividends because again that's the return to investors so they are concerned about that um, so then we have these three sections that go into our um, statement of cash flows. And the first one is from our operating activities. And again, that's the tricky one because there's a lot that goes into the day-to-day -day operations of a company. And when we follow generally accepted accounting principles, we are using accrual-based accounting, meaning we are recording the sale at the time it happens, not when the people pay us. We're recording expenses when we've incurred them, not when we necessarily pay them. So we're going to have to kind of back that out a little bit because we are focused on cash flow. So again, if, if, it's, if the cash hasn't moved yet, we don't want it on our cash flow statement. The second part is, in, and let me go back real quick, the operating activities should be a positive number. This is what the company is in business to do. If they have a negative cash flow, then they are not doing well on their day-to-day -day operations, which means nobody wants to invest in them. Um, but again, the company should have a nice big cash flow coming in here. Then a company that's growing, they're going to have cash going out in these investing activities. So when you think investing, don't think, oh, they're playing in the stock market. That's not what they're doing. They're investing back into themselves. So they are buying um, equipment. They are expanding and going into new geographic areas. They're making new products. They're getting bigger and bigger. So they're putting money back into themselves. So that's what we call investing activities. And I mean, it could also be in the stock market, but again, most companies in that growth phase are gonna be spending money on themselves. Then the third way, so then that should be like a cash outflow normally. Then the third thing is our financing activities. How are they financing that growth? So again, say they're a big company getting bigger, where's that money coming from? Are they getting debt? Um, are they selling bonds? Are they selling stocks? Where's that money coming from? Um, so here they give us some examples. Again, I probably kind of talked a little bit about them. But uh, if we purchase the merchandise, again, that we're going to use to sell and make sales, that's all going to go into the cash flow statement. Um, if we're purchasing those fixed assets, that goes into the investing. And then if we're issuing um, or we could be retiring debt or equity, and again, equity is the stock, common stock or preferred stock. Um, so then how it all kind of comes together, we'll have the Cash flow either um, from, meaning it's a positive number, used means it's a negative number, from our operating activities. Again, there'll be a lot of details in there, though. Then our cash flow used or from the investing activities, and then our cash flow used or from financing. We'll sum all of those up to say what was our net increase or decrease of cash, and then we're going to look back at our balance sheet. What was our beginning cash balance? And then that decrease or increase, plus or minus, or, or like, I guess if this could be a negative number if it's a decrease. So that plus our beginning cash balance should give us our ending cash balance. So the thing I like about the cash flow statement is you can always double check if you did it right, because then your cash at the end of the period should be the cash that's reported on your balance sheet at the end of the year. So then you always know. If you're off, you could subtract it to say, okay, how much am I off by? And then look back through the problem to see if you can figure out what you missed. So here they give us cash inflows and outflows. So if we're in our operating section, it's from the sale of our products or our services. Again, it's what we do in our day-to-day -day business. A cash inflow in investing means we're selling off some of our assets, whether it's property, plant, and equipment, or maybe we are playing in the stock market and we sell some of those. 
um, cash inflows and financing is either we get we sell bonds or we get a loan from the bank or we issue shares of stock. Cash outflows and operating is what are we paying in our day to day bills. So we we buy inventory, we pay our employees, we pay all the employment taxes, we pay our accounts payable as it comes due. So those are all outflows. Um, investing, like I said, is very is if in a growing company, they're buying property, plant, and equipment. They could be they could be playing in the stock market as well. And then if cash out and financing, when they do pay dividends to their shareholders, that's a cash out and financing. And then there could be times that they pay their debt off or that they purchase treasury stock like we had in that last chapter. Um, and then there's the indirect and the direct method. The direct method is more commonly used than the indirect method. So here is the direct method. And again, we've got it, our cash received from our customers, um, or sorry, is it maybe the indirect method that's more popular? What did I? Um, I may have that flip-flopped. Okay, but we'll go over them. Um, so the direct method we've got, we're focused again on receipts. So cash received from our customers, cash paid for merchandise, cash paid for operating expenses, cash paid for interest and, and taxes. So, and that all again deals with our day-to-day -day business. So the primary advantage of that um, direct method is that it's directly reporting the cash receipts and the cash payment. The disadvantage is that it's normally more hard to prepare it because we don't really have that. Okay, so the, the, that is the infrequent one. So I knew one of them was hardly used. So, so the, I said it wrong in the first slide, so I'm correcting it here. So the direct method is infrequently used in practice. It's the indirect method that is more frequently used. So then here is the indirect method. So our indirect method, we always start with our net income. So that is the first line of the operating activities. Then we go through and we adjust it based. So in a sense, like what I like to say is we're, we're getting rid of all those accrual entries that we did. So so maybe like back in one of our first few chapters of this book, we talked about at the end of the year, we do adjusting entries. In a sense, we are reversing those because the adjusting entries never involve cash. Those are all things that we know we've incurred or we know we've performed, but we haven't received the payment yet. So then that's where it gets tricky is then we kind of back out those, those things. But again, there'll be rules that we kind of follow that hopefully will make it a little bit easier. <coughs> but one of the main things is what within that bottom bullet point. We're going to look at the changes in all of the current assets and the current liabilities, and then we're going to adjust for those changes in the operating section. So the primary advantage is we start with net income, and then we are kind of working our way down to what is really the cash flow. And it's less costly to prepare because we're pulling this information directly from the income statement and from the balance sheet. So we really don't have to do anything different like to try to like query out the information. But notice again, you get to the same answers. So it doesn't change what method you use. It's just the ones a little harder to, to get the information to complete it. And then in our investing activities, like I said, a growing company is probably going to have net cash used in investing. So um, inflows would, would happen if we sold our fixed assets or investments. Um, outflows are when we're purchasing those fixed assets or those investments or intangible assets, anything that's considered a long-term asset. So again, let me flip back there. So our, our operating activity is all current assets. Our investing activity is all long-term assets or property, plant, and equipment. Then financing is looking at our long-term liabilities and our equity. So again, if I flip back a couple, this deals with your current liabilities You're in your operating section. So if you're, if you're kind of thinking this through, we are kind of mapping our balance sheet out to say current assets, current liabilities, those changes are shown in our operating section. Long-term assets are in our investing section. Long-term debt and equity is in our financing. So then the whole balance sheet, we've kind of mapped over into what section of the cash flow statement it goes into. 
Um, and then financing, again, is going to be if we borrow money, if we pay dividends, if we sell our stock or purchase shares of treasury stock, all of those go into the financing activities. Then at the bottom, we can have non-cash investing and financing activities. So say we go out, um, like the example it gives here is, say we issue common stock to retire our debt. So maybe we've got bonds that are coming due, and instead of paying cash, we're going to issue shares of common stock. Um, so we talked about those. Those are convertible, convertible bonds. So say that happens. No cash has left the company, but they, it's still a significant transaction. So they're going to put it down at the bottom of that cash flow statement just to note it, to say, um, you know, the, the significant thing happened. So again, that's kind of our setup. Um, and then we can calculate our cash flow per share. Um, so that would be um, our net cash flows divided by our number of shares outstanding. I'm going to let you look through those examples on your own. Um, so then now we get into um, the operating activities section. So what we're focused on, if we look down kind of below, is we are looking at our changes. So um, our change in our current liabilities, um, our change in our uh, current assets, and our, and our, um, our change in stockholders' equity doesn't really impact our operating sections, but I guess it might if you're if you're thinking about net income, because it always starts with your net income and then it goes from there. So yeah, I guess that's true. It is a it is a part of our, our retained earnings, which is in our equity account. So here we have a balance sheet that they give us for the year ended. But again, we are go whilst we're going to want to, or sorry, it's an income statement. We're going to want to pick up off of these numbers our net income. And then one thing that we haven't talked about yet that will be coming up is that depreciation expense. If you remember what depreciation expense is, it's just an adjusting entry that we do at the end of the year. No cash has actually left the company. Okay, then we're going to go through our balance sheet and look at our changes. So what we focus on here is this increase-decrease problem. Um, so then we've got our net income. Now they're going back to our, if, if we didn't have it right off of the um, income statement, which we do, we could also look in retained earnings to say what was closed into it. Those dividends declared will be necessary to know because those go into our investing section. So that's another place you can look at to, to get that information if it's not given to you. Okay. Um, so then, um, again, this is talking about with the fact that we're using that accrual method, and we're basically going to adjust that here when we get into our, um, our, our cash flow. So here is our operating section. So notice the first line item is our net income, which normally we can pick right up off of the income statement. The first thing that we do is, so step one is we add back depreciation of our property, plant, and equipment, amortization of any intangible assets that we had. Um, and th those are always the first two things because, again, both of those are non-cash. They're just journal entries that we do at the end of the year. So we want to add those back when we get to the cash flow statement. Then step two, we want to look to see have we sold any assets. And then if we have we need to adjust our net income for the gain or loss that we've recorded. And then you might think, well, why do we have to do that? Because we are not in the business of selling assets. So let's say I sold a truck and I had a gain on the sale of that truck and I'm a, and I'm a landscaper. Well, I'm in the business of landscaping yards. So that, so selling that truck is like, you know, just an extraordinary type of a thing. It doesn't happen all the time. Um, so I don't want it in my operating section because I'm not in the business of selling trucks. So then I'm going to subtract that gain out. Now where you'll see then, but because then you're thinking, okay, well, I still sold the truck, right? And I got some money. That's going to go in our investing section because that truck is a, is, a, is a property, plant, and equipment. It's a long-term asset. So I'll show the cash down there. I just don't want the gain in my net income or the loss, whichever way that goes. 
Then this I think, so I feel like step one and step two are pretty straightforward. You can get your minds around it. Um, step three is the tricky part. So I would write this down, just write these rules down because that's gonna help you. Sometimes it's hard to like logic it through in your mind. So in accounting, sometimes it's just a matter of knowing the rules. Um, but we're gonna look through all of our current assets and then um, if they increase, if our current assets go up, then we're, it's going to subtract our cash flow. We're going to subtract it here. So inventory is the, is the one that you probably can get your mind around. If inventory increases, obviously I must have went out and purchased inventory. How did I purchase it? I would have paid cash, so cash would go down. But all of them work that same way. So again, whether it's accounts receivable, inventory, prepaids, if they increase, my cash flow decreases. And then the reverse is true. If they decrease, my cash flow increases. So then I think accounts receivable is one that you can logic through. If your accounts receivable goes down, it means your customers have paid you and cash has come in. So if accounts receivable decreases, cash increases. And we want to have that as a plus on our operating section of our cash flow statement. Then accounts payable, if those decrease, it means I've paid my bills, so cash decreases. Actually, any of those payables. If I decrease a payable, it means I've paid it, so my cash goes down. If I increase it, it means I haven't paid it yet, so my cash goes up, at least for the moment. So then we're gonna add those. So jot those down. So basically, kind of the rules are, if the asset goes up, um, cash goes down, so there's an inverse relationship between the assets and cash. There's a direct relationship between the liabilities and cash. If liabilities go down, cash goes down. Okay, so then here again, I think it just gives you the details of those steps like I already talked about. So I'll let you look through the example. <coughs> Excuse me. And then here they show that worked out. Whoops. Okay, so here on um, the next few, few slides are gonna kind of walk us through it. So we've got um, their net income is $100,500, and then we see that there's depreciation expense for $7,000. Then we look at the income statement and we see a gain of $12,000 for the sale of land. So again, we wanna subtract it because it has nothing to do with our operating section we're gonna end up putting the cash flow into the investing section. But so for now, we wanna subtract it. Then we go through and we look at our balance sheet and all of our changes in our, in our current assets and our current liabilities. And we note if they're an increase or a decrease. Um, so again, if accounts receivable goes up, cash goes down. If inventories decrease, cash goes up. Again, there's those inverse relationships. If our accounts payable and our income tax payable and our accrued tax payable, if those go down, cash goes down. If those go up, cash goes up. So again, try to remember those rules. And then here they're talking about it below each one of them. So again, if that if you struggle, you can read back through those. But I, to me, I feel like the easiest thing is to just kind of memorize those rules so you know how to do it. Okay, and then, um, okay, so then here is another, a different example, so you can read through that one. Okay, then we get into our investing activities. So our investing activities, again, we're focused on our long-term assets, and if we're purchasing them, our cash is going down. If we're selling them, our cash is going to go up. Like I said, normally we are purchasing it, but there can be sales. So in this case, there's a sale of land. So we see that land goes down um, by $45,000. Um, so we sold, so, then, so when we see the change, we always got to look in the detail because see in this case, we sold a piece of land for $72,000 cash but then we purchased another piece for 15. 
So just because it changed 45 doesn't mean it was only one transaction. So always kind of just read carefully to make sure that you know. So the, what we sold it for, though, goes into our cash flow um, in the investing section, money coming in. So that's a positive 72000 What we paid to purchase it is money going out, so that's a negative 15000 and then sometimes then where this could get a little bit confusing is when we factor in the depreciation. Remember, depreciation expense is up in our operating section because it's a, it's a um, operating or day-to-day -day type cost. Um, our change in our fixed assets, we need to look at did we purchase any or did we sell any. So again, it's, sometimes it's hard to look at that net change because you got the depreciation in there as well. So just read carefully so you know, in this case, they purchased land for $60,000, or sorry, purchased a building for $60,000. So that's gonna be a use of our cash in the investing section. And, that and the depreciation was already dealt with. So um, then we've got, again, the gain on the sale of land that is up in, that's gonna be up in our operating section. And then down below, um, we've got the cash coming in in the investing. Then our financing section, um, we're going to deal with dividends, common stock, or long-term debt. So here, our bonds payable decreased 50000 So we see that we retired it. So that's a use of our cash. So that would be a negative on our cash flow statement. Then we look at our common stock. It, it, it increased by $8,000, but remember, we also have to look in paid in capital because what's in common stock is just the par value. So when we include the paid in capital, that is going to be our total cash um, that we received. So $8,000 plus $40,000 is cash coming in. Then when we pay out the dividends, we paid them out semi-annually, it looks like. So $14,000 per semi-annual period would be $28,000 paid that year. Um, oh, but then it looks like it wasn't all paid. So we, while we recorded it, there's still $4,000 or 4,000 of that was accrued. So we got to look at, the, at the, what was actually paid out, not was still in the dividends payable. Guys, I'll let you look over. Then here's the total statement of cash flows all together. So again, our operating section provides cash flows from operating activities. Our investing section is cash used in investing. And then we also have cash used in financing. We calculate our net change in cash, add that to our beginning balance, and this ending balance should be what we see on our balance sheet. On um, this free cash flow, um, is a way to kind of measure do they have cash available to use um, and are they having to finance it. So we look at our cash flow coming in from operating, subtract out what we're, we're spending in our property, plant, and equipment in our investing, and that's how much extra cash. If it were negative, then that would mean we need to actually get financing. If it's positive, it means we have the extra cash, so that is favorable. Example you can look over. Um, and then this is kind of like a worksheet or a spreadsheet um, method. And so you're kind of going through the same thing. Let's see if we can get to an example of it. They may not show us. But it's just more of in like a, like a column type format than just going straight down like we were doing. But it's the same kind of same basic process that we analyze those accounts and we and we just put it into the spreadsheet a little bit differently. So here I think they're showing you the example. So you've got your beginning balance, what happened is your debits or your credits to create your ending balance. Um, Yeah, and then this, so I was, I was going to see if it got to like the end, but it just kind of talks about how you're analyzing those. Then this is your direct method. So again, that where you just do the cash received, cash paid, um, and come up with those. And like I said at the first part, it's still this, you get to the same numbers, it's just a little harder to get those, those um, 
in that information. Again, it's going to show you how you would go about doing it. They get, like I said, though, the indirect method is much more common and much less work, so it's more favored in industry. So you can kind of read over those. Um, hopefully you don't have much of that on your tests uh, so or your quizzes. Let that kind of go through and then stop it there.